Hi, I'm Shiv Kumar. Maven Silicon is one of the global training partners of RiskFi International. In this video, I'm going to explain how I authored this RiskFi training course. Also, I will explain how we upskill the engineers on RiskFi. When it comes to upskilling the engineers, we look at whether they are design engineers or verification engineers or embedded systems programmers. If they are dealing with design, then we look at whether they would be using some third-party IPs for their embedded systems controllers or they will be creating their own IPs. And it comes to verification, we look at whether they will be verifying their in-house IPs or they will be verifying the SOCs which have been built with some third-party IPs. When it comes to embedded systems, we train the embedded systems programmers on the RISC-V toolchain. We make them familiar with the RISC-V software ecosystem, how to deal with various things, different kinds of solutions that are available as part of the RISC-V ecosystem, like boards for their application development, simulators for the RISC-V ISA, and all the tools like compilers, assemblers, linkers, RISC-V Open IAC. Why do we need to upskill the engineers on RISC-V? Companies like Apple, they use a RISC processor even for their desktops. They use ARM processor for their MacBooks. They have designed M-series chips like M1 series, M2 series, and M3 series. These OEMs, OEMs like Apple, they use various kinds of processors, primarily RISC processors, and there are other kinds of processors like GPUs, accelerators, application processors, image processors, DSPs, security and neural engines, and coprocessors for the PMUs. RISC processors, mostly they are based on general purpose ISAs, could be ARM or RISC-V. But when it comes to dealing with other processors like accelerators, or coprocessors or application processors, they have to deal with specialized ISCs. So different vendors provide different kinds of processors and each processor could be based on a particular ISC. So they will have to deal with multiple vendors and different vendors may have different licensing schemes. Also different vendors provide different kinds of software stacks. This is going to be very complex. That's where RISC-V offers something like an open IAC. Open IAC means license-free. You can create your own IPs or there are many IP vendors available as part of the RISC-V ecosystem. You can buy the pre-verified IPs and then you can implement your embedded systems controllers or SOCs as you prefer. So RISC-V is going to emerge as an industry standard IAC for all computing devices. It means you can think of designing any kind of processor, whether it's CPU, GPU or accelerators or coprocessors or DSPs, image processors. You can think of using RISC-V for all kinds of processors. That's how RISC-V is going to emerge in the future. How we upskill the engineers on the RISC-V IAC instruction set architecture. Whether they are going to deal with the design or verification or software programming, they have to understand everything as part of IAC. But we explain IAC differently for different kinds of engineers. As part of IAC, they need to understand how it's different from the other instruction set architectures proprietary IACs. So here, a RISC-V has 32 general purpose registers. There is a special register called program counter and it's a layered architecture. It has various things like base IAC. There are various kinds of instructions as part of integer extension. And we also explain how this IAC is different from the other proprietary IACs. This IAC has been architected consciously for the optimized RTL, register transfer level design. There are things designers have to understand how this IAC works. For example, the registers you look at, in this IAC, we don't change their position. They are in the same position, whether it is a source register or destination register. And when it comes to immediate values, 
In risk v we follow sign extension and the sign bit is always MSB. So sign extension can happen in parallel. This improves the performance of the design. There are various kinds of standard extensions available. Integer, multiplication and division, single precision and double precision floating point, compressed instruction. User can also think of adding their own extension as user extension. It could be defined as non-standard extension. And the IEC also defines how to deal with the external memories. RISC-V IEC supports both Little Indian and Big Indian memory systems. But when it comes to instruction fetching, it always follows Little Indian. Then to deal with Big Indian memory systems, it provides privileged architecture. As part of the privileged architectures, engineers need to understand various things like machine IESA, supervisor IESA, and hypervisor extension. It depends on what they want to do. If they are going to implement a simple embedded systems microcontroller, then machine IESA would be good enough. And there they need to understand how to deal with various things like interrupts, exceptions, and primarily the traps, and how to implement things like memory protection. If it is going to be a simple embedded systems microcontroller, then the embedded systems programmers need to understand the ABI. So for them, we focus more on application binary interface. It provides the function calls for the application development. It also defines how to deal with the registers, which register can be used for what. And then we also show them how to deal with a RISC-V tool chain. They may want to deal with bare metal hardware coding or implementing RTAS, or it could be like dealing with an operating system, standard operating system. If they need to deal with a standard operating system, obviously they need to understand the supervisor IEC. That's where they can understand the virtual memory management and memory protection in detail. For example, verification engineers, they will be dealing with the IPs, which could be used for desktops. So in this case, they will have to verify the feature, virtual memory management. They will have to verify the page table translation process that's defined as part of the supervisor IAC. So here, the embedded system programmers need to understand both ABI, ABI primarily for the application development and SBI, Supervisor Binary Interface, to deal with the operating system that they want to build. And then hypervisor extension. It's good to understand how to approach the complex IPs, how to design complex IPs for hypervisors. So in that case, they need to understand the layers like hypervisor extension. And then embedded systems programmers will be dealing with HBI, Hypervisor Binary Interface, SBI supervisor binary interface and ABI application binary interface. And everyone needs to understand the debug architecture. Even embedded system programmers need to understand how to debug their software, how to deal with off-chip debugging. Verification engineers also need to understand the debug architecture. There are many CSRs defined as part of debug architecture and debug is the highest privilege mode. And other things like PLIC platform level interrupt controller. When it comes to interrupts, there could be different kinds of interrupts like timer interrupts, software interrupts. They are all like local interrupts, but there could be many other interrupts for the system, hardware system, and how to interface with multiple interrupts. That's where RISC-V defines platform level interrupt controller. And how to implement various things like simple embedded systems or secure embedded systems or systems running Unix-like operating system or cloud servers using a RISC-V IESA. And there are various kinds of instructions. There are 40 instructions as part of integer extension. And there are other extensions like single precision and double precision floating point, multiplication and division, compressed instructions. And they also need to understand RV64I. What are the differences? So RISC-V provides RISC-V reference green card. It has all kinds of instructions to deal with RISC-V ISA. Engineers have to be familiar with all the instructions. It depends on, again, the application that they want to deal with. All right. RISC-V IP design and design verification. If they want to deal with IP design, they should be familiar with multi-stage pipeline processor design. We give them RTL project. We train the design engineers on the pipeline processor design. 
it's going to be like three stage or five stage processor design. If someone is very new to processor, we take them through processor design methodology. We explain them in detail. We also show them how to improve the performance of the IP. But they can also explore on their own like eight stage pipeline processor or it could be like dealing with dynamic branches. It could be anything. So as part of the RTL design course, we also show them how to improve the performance of the process. Then for the verification engineers, we explain how to create the test bench architecture using UVM framework. For example, how they can model the memories, instruction memories and data memories as slave agents. If the processor is going to use any standard interface like AHB, then how the test bench can be modeled, how the reference model can be created, how they can use register abstraction layer to deal with the registers. So here, everything is going to happen as part of the registers, right? There are 32 general purpose registers. Then how you can use the backdoor access of RAL efficiently to deal with the registers. You can easily find out the values of operands, intermediate values, and you can do the verification efficiently. And how you can think of defining these stimulus using UBA. We will also show them various kinds of flows, verification flows defined by open hardware. There they can also explore the stimulus generator, random instruction generator created by Google. It's very exhaustive. They can do page table translation process verification very efficiently using Google's instruction generator. We also explain the recommended DV flow, how to use formal verification at the block level, how they can think of creating pre-verified design library, and then using the library, how they can design various kinds of processors like three-stage, five-stage, or any kind of multi-stage processor. And when it comes to verifying the IP, how they can think of using UBM efficiently, and also when to use board, prototyping board. For example, to verify the OS booting process, then they can think of using FPGA prototyping. Risk for SOC design and design verification. The SOC could be a simple embedded microcontroller or it could be a complex SOC. This is where we explain them how to deal with an hybrid verification environment. When I say hybrid, it will have all kinds of test bench components, components built with UVM, or there could be some HDL based test bench components, how to reuse some of the legacy test bench components. On top of it, how to make use of the firmware test cases to run the simulation efficiently. So for everything, they can think of creating some kind of wrapper in UVM and then at the top level, they can make use of all the sequences efficiently to try various kinds of scenarios. That's what we explain for the verification engineers, especially for the SOC verification. For the RISC-V programming, we train the embedded engineers on the tool chain. Before training the engineers on tool chain, we also explain various things like application binary interface or supervised binary interface or hypervisor binary interface and how they can deal with various things like bare metal software coding or implementing the operating systems. And when it comes to dealing with tool chains, they should be familiar with all kinds of compilers, assemblers that are available for RISC-V. And also we make them familiar with the RISC-V software ecosystem. There are various kinds of solutions available and how RISC-V supports operating systems like Linux or Android. What is the reality and what kind of development boards are available in the market and how they can make use of various simulators, simulators like SPY to simulate the ISA and how they can deal with things like emulation. And that's what we are going to explain as part of this training. Thank you.